Wipers by Ken Mitchell My name is Ian McElroy. I died September 22, 1917 in the war to end all wars. That's my story, and it's also three lies for the price of one. More or less. Let me explain. As far as everybody knows, Ian McElroy of Thunder Bay, Ontario died at a lovely little circle of hell called Passion Daily, Belgium. The French call it Ypres. We called it Wipers. Okay, truth be known we called it a lot of worse things than that. My friends call me Mace. You can call me Lieutenant Smith, or Lieutenant Jones, or whatever name I'm using at the moment. No offense intended. Again, more or less. Not that anybody is going to read this journal. Unless Dr. Travers finds somebody to hack into my file storage. Nobody is going to see this at all. Hello, nobody. How are you doing today? Me? I'm fine. Just fine. Everything is fine. I'm not seeing things. There are no voices arguing in my head. So there's that, right? Really, considering everything that has happened, I'm doing pretty well. I'm not comatose from shell shock, or whatever it is they are calling it these days. I'm feeling okay for the most part. It's just... The mirror. Yeah, mirrors are not so much right now. Not that I spend a lot of time looking at mirrors. That's not my dance. Somebody like Miller or Johansson, those guys could stare at themselves in the mirror all day. Miller and Johansson. Haven't thought of them in a while. Miller bought it suppressing the riots in New Prague. Johansson checked out. Hmm. I don't remember, but he lost the number of his mess to a sentient bot during a drop in the iron belt. That rock we were dropping on had a number. I guess it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. To die fighting for a rock with no name, just a number. And not even your friends can remember what it was. Damn. Damn, damn, damn. No, I was doing fine until I caught a glimpse of my face in a reflection on an airlock porthole. I learned three things from that experience, and they are as follows. One, despite the claims of the shipyards and manufacturers, a fist in powered armor can. Indeed smash right through one of those things if the puncher is adequately motivated. 2. Replacing doors on a space station airlock is expensive, and will do a real number on. 1's bank account. 3. Some people in command of said space station may, if one were to punch said hole, perturbed enough to send the puncher in for a psyche eval. Ask me how I know. Better yet, don't. I don't know anything about keeping a journal, so I'll probably just do here what I do when I am hanging out with the squad. Tell stories and talk about the past. The future's not worth the mention. I asked Dr. Traverse if that would suffice, and he said it would be fine. But he told me that perhaps I should think about it like telling stories before lights out. So I guess I will. To borrow a phrase from some 20th century horror writer whose name I forget. Here we have it. Here are our bedtime stories for the children of the damned. 2. I just read what I wrote yesterday, and I must say it was pretty grim. Really, I'm not a dingbat or nut. I think it's just the cabin fever of being in these rooms day after day when there's work to be done. I'm feeling like a real simp for getting myself stuck in hotel crackpot. Not everybody that comes through here is being evaluated for something as unique as willful destruction of government property. A trooper from my squad spent the night after they dragged her in, after she drank herself blotto. Her call sign is Noser, three guesses why. Noser likes to say that she has a classical Grecian line to her facial silhouette. Sure, sister, let's go with that. Miller once told her you can't help it that while the rest of us were descended from older forms of humanity, while you've come down from the pachyderms. There's a strict rule against dating fellow squad mates, and there's a darned good reason for it. But from time to time it does happen, and we generally just look the other way. Sometimes I've wondered which of my mates were breaking regs behind closed doors. Some you know are. Some you suspect. Pretty sure that Miller and Noser were not playing hide the sausage after lights out. But then again, I've also noticed that Noser drinks a lot more since Miller became one with the universe by being vaporized by a bright lens beam. I don't have a clock here. I'm in on a 72-hour evaluation, and it's got to be getting pretty close to the time where the staff has to fish or cut bait with me. 
Hopefully they'll realize I am normal screwed in the head and not super mega gold messed up. Looking around this place, I've seen a lot worse than me. A lot worse. The thing is, somebody's got to do the assaults and fly the dropships. Someone has to pull the trigger's amp, direct the drones. Anybody who has been on the pointy end of the lance for a while is going to be a bit nut. Sanity is just a matter of scale. 3. They let me go back to the squad. More later when I have time. 4. Okay, they released me after a long, unfun interview with both Dr. Traverse and a visit from the JAG office's non-judicial punishment department. As I figured, I'm the proud new owner of a slightly damaged airlock door. The JAG LT gave me two options, own my action by accepting a non-judicial punishment, and accept that the replacement cost of the door will be docked from my pay account, or option two, ask for a commander's mast, stand before the station admiral. Lose the case, I mean, I did do it and was recorded by ten devices in the act. I was born, but I wasn't born yesterday. I took the deal. The jag puke had me sign the papers, and she gave me the look if you know what I mean. The, I don't ever want to see your face across the table from me like this again look. I shut up and soldiered. Since I was taken to the evil ward after decanting from my powered armor, I hadn't had an appropriate set of clothing to head back to the base in. Fortunately for me, the staff of the ward has been there, done that, and they assigned me some PT clothes amp, shoes to wear. After I signed away the better part of five years' pay I had in my account, and listened to the treatment plan schedule, no, I didn't get away from future psyche sessions. I was able to walk out into the corridor, and head back to quarters. The hospital area is on an inner ring, of course, and my quarters were two rings out. Instead of just walking over to a drop pole, I decided to get a little exercise and take the stairs. After being cooped up for days in the ward, my muscles were screaming for some exercise, so I decided to run full lap, then go down to ring three and run another there, then down to ring four and finish up with a lap and a half since my berth was on the other side of the station. In all, a quick little five eck of running should set me up, or so I thought. A lot of fellows will tell you that they use their PT time for thinking, but me? I just try to let my mind blank and just feel the rush of the blood through my veins and the air rushing in and out of my lungs. Deck 2's running direction was spinward today, so I headed off and tried to get into a rhythm. My mind did actually lock onto something, however. Strangely enough, it was my journal. As well as you, the nobody who is going to read this. That's right. I have to keep doing the journal. It's part of my ongoing therapy for shell shock, or whatever they call it these days. You. My imaginary non-friend may not be stuck with me, but apparently I'm stuck with you. From now on, you get a handle just like a squad member. Your name is Private Nobody. PN for short. I thought about today's entry and was thinking, so what if PN has never been on a space station? Or if they have, they've never been on a spinner like this one. I guess I better describe the place just a little. Our station, which spins, well, most of it does anyway, does this to simulate gravity. At the core of the space station is a massive rotating central axis area where all of the docking bays and non-gravity work is done. There are labs and several docks for working on Starcraft and other things too boring to mention. Around this axis, at least on our station, are three giant rings that spin around it. This generates artificial gravity through centrifugal force. There's lots of math and stuff involved that determines things like what gravity levels are where. But I'm a grunt, not a math professor, so I'll let that go for now. Each ring has a higher gravity level, ending up at one Earth gravity on the outer ring where the quarters are. Because the three rings are only separated by a few meters of space, the gravity differences are really not that much. The outer rim of the habitat ring houses the station's living quarters, but also all of the gym and training facilities for the troops. I don't know how it is on civvy bases. But we are a military station and whatever else you say about us, we do take our training seriously. It does take a bit of time to get used to, though. The floors and walls are perpendicular to the direction of gravity, allowing us, at least to some degree, to work in a way somewhat similar to Dirtside. Still with me so far, P.N.? Of course you aren't. You never were. Anyway, the next ring in, we call it, in brilliant military fashion, ring, is where most of the recreational areas are. That's where we engage in relaxation and leisure activities, as the station welcome guide would tell you. In truth, 
It's mostly used by the senior officers, civvy contractors, and their family. The civvy gym is located there, and there are a couple of parks that kind of sort of simulate actual plants and trees and such. There's also a theater and a couple of common rooms with large view screens that show panoramic views of space, or whatever else Julie the cruise ship entertainment director feels would be good for morale. I always thought those types of rooms would have really big actual windows, but apparently there's no way to make big chunks of glass sturdy enough to do that. So, view screens it is. Our current Julie, the cruise ship entertainment director, JCS for short, is an LTJG just up from dirt side, and he's all full of great ideas to inflict on us during mandatory fun events. God help us all. Are you tired of reading about the station? Good, because I'm all thought out for the day. I hit my quarters, and the only person there was Tex, who was sound asleep and snoring louder than a battery of French 75Ms barking at Fritzy. I'm done. Time to hit the shower, then the rack. Good night, dear PN. I'll see you tomorrow. Unless I forget. 5. Hi again, PN. Hope your morning started well. Mine? It started with Tex. Tex is my squad sergeant and second to me in the chain of command for the unit. Somehow or other, I managed to get myself promoted to LTJG last year, which is a really strange rank for an army grunt to have. I have no idea how, but sometime down the line, our forces made some changes in the rank structure, and second lieutenant was eliminated in favor of the U.S. Navy's rank of lieutenant junior grade. Other ranks were switched and eliminated, and I'm sure it made some sense to somebody at the time. I've never gotten a straight answer about why we are using American ranks. I'm not a bloody yank, I'm from Ontario. On the day I died but didn't die, I was a quartermaster sergeant, 4th BDA sent bad, in the 2nd Canadian Division under Lieutenant General Arthur Curry. God rot his soul. We have no quartermaster sergeants, nor color sergeants or room sergeants in this here Space Force. I miss them. I've heard some former U.S. Marines talk about their gunnery sergeants but I've yet to hear of one they missed. So, anyway, back to Tex. Tex is an American, of course, and while those uninitiated in the use of call signs might well assume this means he's from Texas, he's not. He's most definitely not. Our good sergeant. Tex is from Brooklyn, New York. He's 162 centimeters tall and weighs in at a whopping 80 kilograms. You know, these metric measurements, probably all that you have ever heard of, since you weren't born 600 years ago like I was PN, still make me stop and think. In real measurements, Tex comes in at 5 foot, 5 inches, and about 180 pounds of pure muscle. Why Tex? Because everything is bigger in Texas, so what else could you call a 162 centimeters marine from Brooklyn than Tex? Get it around, so. You are probably wondering where I got the name Mace, am I right? Well... You get to just keep on wondering because I'm writing this journal, and I'm not saying. X was doing text-like things in the common room of the squad area. What are text-like things? Push-ups. Sit-ups. Pull-ups. Planks. Some people are subtle, but Tex isn't one of them. Tex is a hammer who sees everything else like a nail. He's a little hard on the furniture, but in a fight against rebels, bugs, or droids, he's the guy you want at your side. All my grunts are. It's a good squad. Not surprising, I guess, because HR doesn't portal slackers, malingerers, bunkhouse lawyers, and cowards. Occasionally one will get through, and we sometimes have to deal with that. But HR does a pretty good job of research, and the members of the bag crew are very effective at their jobs. Albeit, they are absolutely ruthless. I'm not really sure what the researchers saw in me, but I was bagged and I suppose I should be grateful. There's no question I would have died holding on to that bloody fragment of duckboard in that hole in the mud. Not at all. The shell that would have got me was already on the way. I would have wiped absolutely, and for keeps, and nobody would have known where and how I died. There wouldn't be a gram of flesh to bury. Well, that's kind of the whole point of the bag, isn't it? I didn't die, though nobody back then knows that. Knew that? I know. Whichever way you want to deal with the time, it's kind of strange how that all works. Ian McElroy, quartermaster sergeant, 4th BDA St. Bat, was just a name on a wall they put up a couple of decades later. Even that's long gone now, of course, 
given what happened to Earth. And now I'm here. Like I said, I suppose I should be grateful to be alive. I can't really imagine why I would, though. Okay, enough of this. Time to get to work. Six. Wow. I really got off track there. I never made it back to Tex. We can't have that. I met Tex about four years ago, current time. He also died in the war to end all wars, although his demise was months after mine at a place called Muse. Argonne in September 1918. He was in a place called the Argonne Forest, or so he tells me, a park company, the infantry regiment, the infantry division. Cut off and surrounded, Tex bit it like most of the rest of us, from a Fritz artillery shell. At least I hope it was one of theirs, not one of ours. It matters to the guys who dropped the round, if not to the guys on the dying end of it. I'm sure there probably was a memorial somewhere that had the name Corporal Itzak Cohen on it. There was probably a round frame with an aging brown picture of him forever 19 somewhere in a loved one's parlor. Then an attic. Then an antique store where people only cared about the age of the object, not the life of the man locked inside. For us it was four years ago. For Earth? At least for what is left of it. It's been forever, or near enough to forever as to make no difference. In some ways, Tex is the best of all of us. The way he can make us crack a smile even when we are pinned down with enemy fire raining down on our heads. I remember a couple years ago, we were working on cleaning out a nest of sentient bots. Tex decided it was high time to shout out insults at the contraptions. Tex let out a long stream of what I can only assume was pure filth at the robots, and one of the things actually popped its head up out of curiosity. Noser proceeded to take the exposed noggin off with a shrike round. I had to know. Tex, what on earth were you yelling at them? He got a somewhat chagrined look on his face and said my grandmother would be very upset with me, so I'm not going to repeat it. I was like, man, I gotta know, I don't speak Yiddish. Turns out, he grinned back. The bots do. Seven. So where is our home away from home? Helvetio Station, of course. If I had known anything about celestial navigation back in my days fishing with my father on Lake Superior, I could have looked at the Sea of Stars at night and picked out the Pegasus constellation. Well, our home away from everything else orbits the third planet in the Peg star system. Now I can fly a dropship and I can even program a destination in the Navsis, but actual navigation? No way, I'm useless. Out here, there are no constellations, of course, since those patterns only appear like that when standing on a planet in our solar system. Peg is a ridiculous distance from old Earth, because everything not actually a part of the solar system is a long way from the ancient dirt. Well, of course, you catch a ride with the bugs. Then, step on. Have dinner, grab a night's sleep, and Bob's your uncle you are fifties light years from where you started. Look, I like the bugs just fine, I'm no Xeno, but even if one would tell me how they do all that faster than light speed stuff, and they won't, I wouldn't understand it. Of course, P.N., you probably know as much about space and time spirals as I do. Well, you would if you were real, which you are not. I bring all of this in case you are wondering why such a crack squad of troopers are just sitting around on our tails doing nothing in a universe filled with war. Sigh. As a unit, we were wiped. For the bee counters at command, it's just math. They call it the casualty threshold, the number of troopers who get wiped on a given deployment. Of course, they won't tell anybody exactly what that number is, but since we lost 32% wiped and another 12% down for the count, it stands to reason that it's about 40%. Ish. So here we sit, as the new troopers are in training. We won't have to wait for them to be brought through the portal, and they are already trained to some extent by the forces that they were in. For the most part, we are a great war division. I guess it makes sense that they keep people who were collected at about the same time together. Even though we are from all over the planet, we have similar frames of reference. We all remember reading about Titanic. Well, except for Jester, of course, who was on Titanic when it went down. I hope Jester's doing all right. He lost both of his legs right above the knees and would have wiped if Pistol hadn't carried him out. Getting new legs grown back, or any limb at all for that matter, is no fun at all. The bug doctors will squeak you that it won't hurt, 
and it doesn't exactly hurt, but it sure doesn't feel very good. Not at all. Ask me how I know. One thing they never do is put enemies in units with each other. I know there's a division of Fritz soldiers from our war out there somewhere, but we've never met them. I've met some Americans from the next war, the one in the 40s, and he said that they only brought in Allied soldiers. American, French, British Empire, Russia. No Germans. I don't know why. We got to know one squad of them pretty well. Tex asked one of them, a fellow New Yorker from Flatbush, about it. Not my place to say. Itzak, not my place to say. I guess these guys didn't yet realize that we aren't Ian McElroy, Itzak Cohen and Constantina Antonopoulos. Noser's wife name is longer than her snout. Those are the names we were before we were wiped on Earth, and they won't be used again until we wipe up here. Johansson was Barber, and Miller was Dice in our unit. Then they wiped, and became Johansson and Miller. That's the way it is. Let's be clear about one thing right now, P.N. You gotta understand this. We were brought here to do a job, whether we like it or not. We are here to be wipers. We are not here to be wiped. 8. Flash alert. I'll get back to this when I can. 9. Well, this is a pretty mess of fish we are in. We're being called back just as soon as our fresh meat arrives. No chance for orientation for the new grunts. No integrations. Nothing. Worse, it looks like we are going to go back to the Iron Belt again. Another batch of bots has gone sentient, and we've got to go hunt them down and wipe them. Again. Look, as I said before, I'm not a Xeno, but I've just about had enough of the killer robots from the Great Beyond plotline in my life for a while. I'm told that the new troops will arrive first shift tomorrow, then we will load into a hauler and head out. The bugs can get us there pretty fast, all things considered, but traveling steerage in a bug hauler is not quite up there with first class on the Olympic or Mauritania. Not that I ever, of course, did that. I did ride the SS Onoko from Thunder Bay to Duluth and back once when my uncle was a crewman, but I mostly just saw the mounds of coal I was shoveling into the firebox. Bug transports are not very comfortable, but at least we don't have to spend our days shoveling coal into their engines.